Good morning and welcome to Kearsarge Community Presbyterian Church here in New London, New Hampshire. We are appreciative of your joining us for this virtual worship service for Sunday, April the 11th, 2021. We would uh, like to keep you up to date with some of our prayer concerns. Uh, please keep the family of Eleanor Allman in your prayers. Ellie joined the church triumphant or Good Friday evening. She was the director of music here at KCPC from 1990 until 2010. She served several other churches, both here in New Hampshire and also in Connecticut as an organist. So please check Chadwick's uh, funeral home for details on her memorial service. Please keep Dion Forcier in your um, prayers. She's recovering from sh shoulder surgery. Hank Hopeman asks for your prayers as he makes decisions regarding future treatment of cancer. Remember Robert Young in your prayers as he recovers from a stroke. Uh, Robert is the husband of Donna and father of Stephanie Young. Continue to pray for Doris Huntley at New London Hospital and Dan and Lindsay Harkins as they recover from their COVID-19 infections. Late in March, the elders met and discussed when KCPC might be able to reopen. And while a final decision has yet to be made, we are hopeful that if the vaccination rate is at about 60% and the infection rate extremely low by the middle of June, we can open with restricted worship on the first Sunday in July. And if the vaccination and infection rates remain favorable through the summer, we might be able to more fully open with fewer restrictions after Labor Day. We thank you for your patience and your understanding as we make these difficult and challenging decisions. Remember, the shopping cart for your food donations to area pantries is available every Sunday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Uh, we are grateful and thankful for your support of this important ministry of serving our local neighbors who have need. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. There the Lord ordained his blessing, granting life forevermore. Let us pray. O oh, good and patient Lord God, we give you our thanks and appreciation for last Sunday's ability to celebrate Easter despite our separation. Even when we cannot gather physically in community, you have drawn us together by your blessed spirit. In our faith, we are united to explore and grapple with doubt, despair, joy, and astonishment. In times of doubt and question, we seek answers and we know how your son Jesus, the one resurrected to eternity, comes to reassure and to still our fears. We remain grateful for his continued presence and his ability to bring answers to our troubled souls. As we move into and through this blessed season of Easter, may our minds and our spirits be nourished by the challenges faced by those first disciples. May their example lead us towards strengthened faith and increased courage to give witness to our resurrected Lord and Savior, who taught long ago that we should pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
By God's great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Together, may we experience such mercy as we confess our sin to the Lord. Let us pray. O oh, merciful God, as the Sundays after Easter unfold, we learn how the earliest disciples learned to live in community with one another. Their task to do so was not easy, and it was fraught with challenges from many sources. We confess how our own community of faith finds itself challenged in the 21st year of the 21st century. COVID-19 places our emotions on edge. Our desire to regather plays havoc on our ability to remain safe. We find ourselves frustrated and lacking patience. We point fingers, yet fail to examine our own hearts. Even as we falter, remind us of your son's tolerance with Thomas and his other disciples. Even in doubt, Jesus welcomed those who did not believe. Gracious Lord, forgive us our sins through Jesus the risen one on this day and always. And hear us now in the silence of this day as we bring to you our individual confessions. Amen. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. My life flows on in endless song above us lamentation i hear the sweet the far off hymn that hails the new creation through all the tumult and the strife i hear the music ringing it finds a
Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced. And when they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, and Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This week is normally one which challenges a significant portion of the adult population. Did you know that this coming Thursday has a very special name? That's right, it's Tax Giving Thursday. Fortunately, we who tend to wait to the last day or days to file our taxes have been given a reprieve. For the second year in a row due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the filing deadline has been extended. This year, we have an extra month to file. Speaking of taxes, someone who once said that a penny saved is simply a government mistake. Or did you know that a harp is a piano after taxes? Or did you know that a ukulele is a piano after a tax audit? Now, of course, there's that, also there's that old expression, death and taxes are inevitable. But death, for some reason, doesn't repeat itself year after year after year. And finally, have you ever noticed that if the space between the two words, the IRS, is removed, it spells T-H-E-I-R-S, theirs. Now, how ironic is that? We have an extra month to file our taxes this year. Will you wait until the last minute? Do you dread each year's tax filing deadline? Now, to be honest, I am a tax filing procrastinator. Rarely do I manage to file more than a day or two ahead of time, and I have regularly throughout the course of my adult life requested an extension. Also, after I complete my tax forms and send them off now through the internet, I always doubt if I have done so correctly. I always suspect that I've made some error, not intentionally, mind you, but simply out of the frustration of attempting to understand the complex forms and the less than helpful explanations that come with them. I always doubt that I've filed correctly. 
Doubt is an emotion which can seize and fill us with uncertainty. Doubt whittles away at our confidence. We can be certain the emotions being processed by the disciple Thomas played a big role in the doubt that he expressed when he was told about the risen Lord Jesus. He was certain of Jesus' death on the cross. He had witnessed Christ's last agonizing breaths. Thomas had seen the Roman guard pierce his side with a spear. Thomas knew beyond a shadow of a doubt Jesus was dead and buried. His body had become lifeless. It wasn't logical to believe that Jesus had been brought back to life. Only Jesus had the power to do so. He had raised Lazarus from the grave. But how could Jesus raise himself from death and beat down the stone sealing his tomb? To do so was an impossibility. It made no sense to Thomas. Now, we should be grateful to the gospel writer John for including this account, which describes the doubt Thomas felt when he was told about Christ's resurrection. While the other gospel writers depict the doubt of all the followers of Jesus, they do so in oblique ways, not in with specifics. They do not spell it out directly, nor assign it to a particular disciple, as does John. So when we read these verses, there can be no question in our minds. Thomas did not believe what the other disciples had told him. We read how he demands physical proof in order to be persuaded. Thomas needs to touch Jesus. He needs to hear his Lord speak. He needs proof before his doubt will abate. We can easily understand his skepticism. We've all been in this disciple's shoes to one extent or another. I know many of you are seasoned Red Sox fans. And even if you're not, I want you to think back to the year 2004. If you'd been camping out in the wilderness or shipwrecked on a deserted island and had no means of communication whatsoever during the entirety of October of 2004, would you believe the first person who told you the Red Sox had won the World Series that year? Probably not. You would want to see the newspapers from the day after the big game. You would want to see the video highlights of the series. You would make certain you were not being made the fool by asking to see real evidence of the Red Sox that they had beaten the eight decade long curse of the Bambino. Just like Thomas, you would demand proof and would be rather specific about what you needed to see, read, or watch. Doubt is what motivated Thomas to learn more about the claims of the risen Lord Jesus. It would appear that he no longer was away from the company of his other disciples as he was on that first Easter morning. Doubt motivated him to remain with them at all times. Either Jesus would appear again, proving Thomas to be wrong about his assumptions, or Jesus would not make a visit, and the credence of Thomas's original assertion would have more strength. According to John, a week passed before Jesus appeared to his disciples a second time. We might guess that Thomas was feeling rather smug about his assertion that unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark in, in his side, I will not believe during those intervening six days. After all, a Jesus raised from the grave had not appeared to anyone in the interim time. But on the seventh day, after the resurrection morning, Jesus does arrive back at the same house under the same mysterious conditions with the doors closed. Jesus does not come and knock on the door or stride through the entranceway. Jesus 
simply appears. And this time, Thomas is present. And the Lord immediately approaches his doubting disciple, takes his hand, and places it on his body, inflict it with the wounds from the cross. Even as Thomas had strongly objected and doubted the word of his fellow disciples a week later, earlier, he now, with his whole heart, professes his belief in the resurrection by proclaiming, my Lord and my God. Thomas's firm and unwavering doubt was quickly transformed into unflinching belief. The Bible does not tell us anything more about this disciple. Thomas simply seems to vanish from the subsequent pages of scripture, which kind of seems odd after he is so well highlighted here. After all, the initial reaction of skepticism by Thomas is typical of all of our human behaviors. We can each identify with this, this disciple out of our own moments of disbelief and doubt. But recall that Jesus was not with his disciples much longer after this evening, just another five or so weeks before he would ascend into heaven. And just before the moment of ascension, Jesus gave us what we call the Great Commission, which directs disciples, his disciples, and disciples of all ages to go to the ends of the earth and make disciples in my name. Well, Thomas must have taken this commission to heart, and he found himself in India, as tradition tells us. There along the southern and eastern coastlines of the ancient civilization, the formerly, formerly doubting disciple Thomas established strong and lasting faith communities. Under this apostle's leadership, the church of a risen Lord Jesus grew and flourishes to this very day in India. Thomas turned his doubt into belief and his belief into action. The fact that the church was established in a most distant corner of the known world should allay any skepticism we might have about the Apostle Thomas. He did in fact come face to face with his risen Lord and he went to India to prove it. Thomas can be an example for us each. No matter how trusting or how cautious you are at accepting the teachings of the Christian faith, we are called as believers and as followers of Christ to go forth and to teach all people as Jesus commissioned. We are not called to sit out on our laurels and constantly attempt to poke holes in our faith. We are not supposed to act on our own gut instincts of what makes sense to me in my own feeble mind is the ultimate truth. If we get caught up in doing so, all we're doing is trying to make ourselves into gods, and we know that's impossible. God, our creator, and the only son, Jesus, are so much bigger and so much fuller and more complete than our knowledge and our logic can ever be. So when we doubt, we should also temper our uncertainty with trust. We should trust that our Lord has a purpose and even when we cannot make sense of some miraculous activity or teaching in the Bible, we should trust our Lord. We should trust that even when our inclination is to hold back from sharing the faith because of our uncertainty, God calls us to contribute, to work past our doubt, to not let our misgivings stop us from our call to be faithful in our discipleship. As you can see, doubt and belief go together. They provide balance and perspective to each other. They challenge the other, so long as one never dominates nor controls the other emotion. Our Lord did not reject Thomas, nor did Jesus ridicule him because of his initial doubt. 
And nor did Thomas sulk away when he was proved to be initially wrong. Instead, the Lord worked in and through him to establish a great and lasting church in, uh, in faraway India. The resurrected Lord Jesus blesses Thomas in the end, just as Christ continues to bless us as we turn our doubts into actions and ultimately into belief. Let us pray. O oh, mysterious and challenging Lord God, we live in awe and wonder of your presence in our world. Even when we feel most separated from you, you remain patient, caring, and ready to wrap us once again into your constant embrace. Even when we demand proof, you do not waver, yet remain strong and certain in your love and mercy, freely given to us despite our errant ways. As we make our way through the season which follows Easter, leading to Christ's ascension into heaven and the arrival of your Holy Spirit on Pentecost, make us each aware, Almighty God, how your power and presence in the world remains certain and true. Work through us each to grow our personal faith and to nurture and support the faith of others. Guide us to take and use the challenges we face to be supportive and encouraging to others who struggle as we too have labored to remain faithful. O Lord of all healing, of comfort and strength, of caring presence and love, we lift to you our special prayers for this day. We give thanks for the life and service of your servant Eleanor Allman, for her devotion to church music and choirs, for more than half a century and her 20 year ministry here in our congregation. We thank you for reuniting her with your, in your heavenly splendor with her beloved Dudley, her brother and extended family. Bring peace and unity to her children and their families as they mourn her passing from your earthly life to your heavenly eternal eternity. We pray as well for Robert Young, asking that you will return him to wholeness and well-being after his stroke. Grant your strengthening presence to his wife, Donna, and children, Stephanie and Matthew. Be with Dion Forcier as she recovers from shoulder surgery. Continue to bring strength and good spirits to Doris Huntley in her recovery from surgery and infection and help Hank Hopeman to find answers and make decisions as he prepares to embark upon treatment for his cancer. Continue to bring strength and perseverance to all who coordinate and administer the vaccination programs, both in our state, in our country, and throughout the world. May their tireless work, dear Lord, bring to fruition the return of our world to more normal times. We ask all of this in Christ Jesus' blessed name. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Guide it and direct it by the power of his resurrection. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.